Welcome everyone to the Sandwich Public Library. My name is Matthew and I'm the Adult Services Coordinator here at the library. Thanks for tuning in. I see um, some folks popping in just now and uh, we're so glad that you've decided to share some time with us this beautiful Saturday morning and to learn. I'm excited to learn alongside of you and today I think we're going to learn a lot. We have an excellent presenter with us, uh, Steve Wolf, who is a Master Gardener through the University of Illinois Extension, Kendall County, uh, will be sharing with us today on how to plan and plant a vegetable garden. Um, so we're very much, very much looking forward to hearing from him. Steve, thank you for sharing your time with us, your expertise, your knowledge. Uh, we're so looking forward to learning from you. And um, just a few instructions as we get into the webinar today. Um, you should, should, should be able to see at the bottom of your screen uh, a chat feature and a Q&A feature. Um, on, in the chat, if everyone could start by um, telling me how many people are viewing and uh, where you're viewing from, that would be excellent. So that's how you can test out that chat feature. Go ahead and let us know how many folks are viewing with you and where you're viewing from. And at any point that you have a question for Steve, you can put that question either in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Either one's just fine. We're gonna hold all of those questions until the end and I'll uh, ask those questions, as many of them as we can get through, I will ask those uh, to Steve on your behalf. So at any point, feel free to drop a question in the chat or the Q&A. And if you would uh, let us know who's, how many are viewing with you, that would be very helpful for us as well. Um, so again, welcome. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And uh, Steve, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Matt. Well, here we are, the sun is shining. We should probably all be outside working in the garden, but uh, it's a little chilly yet and the time will come. It is really too early to get started unless you have uh, some containers that you can work with. So anyhow, as Matt said, I am a master gardener with the University of Illinois Extension and I'm out of Kendall County. Even though I live in Sandwich, uh, Sandwich as you know is split partially between DeKalb and Kendall. So you don't have to live in the county that you volunteer in. So why should we plant a garden anyway? Well, how about this reason? It's cheaper than therapy and you get tomatoes and lots of other good stuff too. And here's another reason. Some people hope they could grow the food they like. Unfortunately, this guy couldn't. But that is one good reason to grow your garden. You can plant whatever you want and grow the stuff you like. Here are some real reasons. Veggies are very nutritious. Fresher is better than what you get in the store often, especially if you're looking at uh, fruit-like produce. Controlled use of pesticides is another significant issue. Um, You've all been told, I'm sure, to thoroughly wash everything you buy in the store. And that is a good recommendation because you don't know for sure how much has been used. And the only thing you really know is unless you buy organic, there has been pesticides used on your products. You might have family fun in the garden. If you have kids and you can convince them to get out there that it really fun instead of sitting in front of the computer or the video games, good luck with that. It really can be fun. And the more kids you can get involved in it, the better off we all are. Again, you get the food you want, as I mentioned, you get some exercise and mental therapy to save on your budget. And you can save money, you know, to buy a packet of seeds for 250 or whatever is a lot cheaper than buying all the produce fresh. So as an overview, these are the topics that we're gonna talk about briefly each one, planning garden, preparing your site, deciding on methods. You have to have a plan and you have to decide how you're gonna do it before you start. Then planting the actual garden, 
and caring for the garden, maintaining it and harvesting it, okay? Choosing the best location, this is important. You have to have good soil. Unfortunately, in our area, there is a lot of clay and clay makes it difficult for vegetables to root in and grow well. So if you have heavy clay soil, you really need to improve it with compost, manure, and other additives, okay? Loosen it up. You can use your leaves from your trees every fall by plowing them in, letting them rot over the winter and then doing it, all kinds of ideas. You have to choose a site also that offers you proximity to a water supply, because if you're relying totally on the rain, you could be out of luck. Last summer especially was very warm and dry in July and August. Proximity to your home is best. If you're close by, you're going to get out there and you really need to check on things in a big garden every day. There's probably something that needs to be done. So closer you are to home, the better. Now there are community gardens available in Sandwich, the Park District offers community garden space outside of town. In Plano, the uh, Plano Community Garden is huge. So that's available too, if you can make the trip to a community garden space, that's good too. Suitable to landscape design. <clears throat> in other words, your vegetable garden needs to be away from large trees and shrubs which will shade it and suck moisture and nutrients from the soil. And um, what, I missed uh, talking about the critters there, but we'll get back to them later. If you, what, what I was gonna say is if you live such as a lot next to a timber line or a forest, every animal in the forest is gonna see your garden as a buffet, okay? So you're gonna to have to work with that. Vegetables love sunlight. Okay, this little drawing here just shows how photovoltaic modules or solar panels are usually positioned facing the south to southwest. Okay, your garden needs a lot of sun. Ideally, a full sun day but mine doesn't get all full sun and it does well with six hours, four to six hours. And then as I mentioned, clearance from big trees and shrubs is important. If you're gonna start a brand new garden, I don't know how many of you are gardening already, uh, but if you wanna start from scratch, turn a lawn into garden, that's a little bit of work, but you can do it. Many people do it, I've done it. If you have a whole lot of debris on the property or want to turn into a garden, you might need to burn it off and get rid of it. I'm not talking about just burning off lawn grass, but tall weeds and, and debris that's fallen and left on the ground over winter. If you're doing just a lawn to get rid of it, um, you can remove it by hand. If it's a small space, I don't recommend uh, doing uh, 20 by 40 plot by hand. You can rent a sod cutter or you can hire a landscaper to cut the sod out, which then gives you good sod if you need it elsewhere, or he might take it and use it if you hire someone. Or you can rototill it in, people do that. The problem with rototilling sod, which maybe you've seen happen, is that uh, the roots stay underground and will regrow all throughout that year and maybe even the next year in your vegetable garden, you'll have grass trying to grow up. Another way to handle it is to use what's called sheet mulch, which can be sheets of black plastic, sheets of heavy cardboard like refrigerator boxes that you or grocery store boxes that you slice up and lay on the grass itself which will then kill the grass, okay? Ideally, you wanna do that in fall and make sure by spring, everything's dead underneath it. 
but you can go out there and do it now. If you leave it for a few weeks, it will kill a lot of the plant material underneath it. Uh, problem is, of course, you need to weight down that sheet mulch, whatever it is you use, either with garden spikes holding it in the ground or uh, bricks or rock or something on it so it doesn't blow away in the wind. But it works well. Or lastly, and, and I always put chemicals as a last resort, uh, can spray it with any kind of glyphosate product like Roundup or others, which of course will kill any plant growing there. So it, some people are concerned that if you spray ground with glyphosate, that'll damage your vegetable crop. And it's not been my experience and it's not been proven that it will do that. Okay. I wouldn't want to spray and then immediately plant, but if you give it some time, it will be gone. Once your ground is clear, the best thing you can do for your soil is again, add organic material, compost, leaves, whatever you have available, and till that in once you got rid of the sod. Or if you don't want to till the whole garden up, if it's too much, just spade the areas that you want to plant, whether it's a long row of lettuce or individual sites for tomatoes and peppers and such. Various ways to handle things in every case. Garden layouts come in all shapes and sizes, long and narrow, square, rectangular, circular, uh, fit the space, fit the design to the space, okay? Some people do vertical growing, greatly saves your space. Now, some of these are shown in raised beds, but they don't have to be like the center designs. It's a typical tomato cage and a pole bean tent. And this kind of structure will help you grow uh, peas, for instance, or cucumbers, whatever you might be, lots of options. Raised beds are an advantage. There are lots of benefits to them. I use some raised beds in addition to my flat garden space. Uh, soil warms earlier in spring when you raise it up. Better drainage in wet times is a good thing, but in a hot, dry summer can be a little bit of a negative. You have to water more often in a raised bed, just like you do in, in hanging baskets on your porch or pots, anything above the ground loses water faster, okay? Makes it easier to uh, fertilize and water the bed only rather than watering the whole garden or fertilizing the whole garden. You limit your space. Gives you easier access as you walk right around the square raised bed to harvest and pull weeds and increased aeration of plants as they're raised above ground level. Uh, aeration is always good, which is why they all recommend planting plants not right next to each other because two crowded sites in damp, moist air breeds fungal disease, okay? Some more examples of raised beds. Most of you I'm sure have seen them before and maybe even have some. Container gardening is also another version of raised beds. If you have little or no ground space, you can still grow vegetable garden in containers. Tomatoes, peppers, various things can be grown. Almost, almost anything except maybe sweet corn or pumpkins that need a lot of space to spread out. If you don't have a good location, you can move a container wherever it might do better, okay? Containers can be decorative in your landscape, easily harvestable, and as I said, they're not good for all vegetables, but many. They might require more water and fertilizer, and you have to make sure you have a proper container for each plant. They also offer you the ability to avoid bending over. If you are, if you have some back trouble or if you're just a little bit older and your knees don't work as well, I guess you could say they also keep your dog out of the garden in this case. 
uh, farm troughs are often used as container gardens, okay? And there's a whole program we do on uh, raised bed gardening and container gardening. So I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail on that here. Next thing, decide what you wanna plant. I mentioned earlier, plant what you like, what your family will eat, what they enjoy. Um, you have to think about your space considerations. You can't plant uh, pumpkins in a two by two space, okay, for example. Hybrids and heirlooms, there are many varieties of vegetables. Hybrids have been designed by horticulturists in all the uh, seed catalog companies that sell them, like Burpee and Stark Brothers and Gurney and others. <clears throat> Hybrids give you specific size, shape, color, and disease resistance. That's a big thing that hybrids give you. Heirloom plants are those that are kept over from generations often and provide sometimes better flavor than hybrids, but they are usually not disease resistant. So that can be a problem. You also have to know if you wanna be a seed saver from your garden, you can save heirloom seeds and be guaranteed to grow the same type plant the next year. But if you have a hybrid, what they call an F1 hybrid, you can't be guaranteed to get what you think you're gonna get from those seeds. You might, but then again, you might not. That's just how genetics works. Uh, consider how much maintenance you need. Some vegetables are higher or lower maintenance than others, okay? And a harvest schedule. Make sure somebody is gonna be around to harvest your vegetables. If you take off for a month in the summer, somebody has to watch over them. Some plants, as I said, are a little easier than others to grow. Most root crops don't take a lot of work, nor do summer squash and winter squash, okay? Greens like lettuce and spinach usually grow pretty readily, but peas, peppers, tomatoes, green beans, all of those involve a little more work. And we could spend an hour on each if we wanted to talking about how best to handle them. You can plant your garden either from seeds or by buying plants. I'm sure you've all been to the big box stores and the nursery garden centers like Redbud or Ace Hardware even has taken even grocery stores like Jewel sell a lot of plants. Seeds can be bought in many stores, Walmart, Ace Hardware, or from catalog companies. And you can be pretty well sure that when you buy a seed packet from a reliable company, that it'll be quality seeds. You cannot expect to get 100% germination from your seeds, but you should get between 50 and 100%. And most of the time between 75 and 100%. So reliable. If you buy seeds, you can store them from year to year. You need to keep them cool and dry. Some people put them in a refrigerator that's fine, you don't have to. I usually keep mine in a box in the garage, or unheated garage over the winter. Plants that you're looking to buy, look at them, examine them. They should be healthy. Compact, bushy plants, not tall, leggy, spindly things. That means they haven't had enough sun when they were growing. You wanna make sure you don't see bugs all crawling all over them or spots of disease, whether they're black fungal spots on the leaves or something on the soil, whatever it might be. Take a look at them closely before you pay your money. If you buy seeds, read the seed packet, okay? All of this information is usually contained on the front and back of the package like this, okay? Most any question you have might be answered there. If not, 
you all know how to work Google, I think. Specific information on most any vegetable is readily available. Or you can also contact your Master Gardener help desk, which we'll talk about later. Okay. You have to have necessary equipment and supplies to uh, keep your garden moving. Spades and shovels come in all sizes and shapes. A square shovel like this is not of real value in a garden. Usually you need a pointed shovel if you're going to dig or a spade shovel like this, okay? Longer handles are typically better than shorter handles because you don't have to bend over quite as much. You do need rakes and hoes and little hand trowels if you're going to plant individual pepper plants, for instance, okay? You will want a measuring stick of some kind, a tape measure, whatever you might use to gauge space between rows and between plants. And a rain gauge will help you know how much rain you've had and do you need to supplement, okay? Hoses are necessary. You have to get water to the plant somehow if it's not raining. Okay, I'll show some more pictures like this. This is a drip irrigation or soaker hose system. You might need fencing, which we'll talk about later. Might need fertilizer. Some people use insecticide. I don't use much of that, but some people don't want a single bug on their plants. And that's pretty tough. Planning is important when planting a vegetable garden. You have to have a good design layout before you start. Know what you're going to plant, what's the best layout for those kinds of plants. For instance, tall plants should be planted so that they don't block short plants with shade. Tall plants like tomatoes or sweet corn you don't want to try to grow something behind the shade of a sweet corn plot, for instance. Consider how much water each plant will take, sunlight requirements, which is pretty much the same for all vegetables. You might want to consider successive planting when your early spring plants are done, like lettuce, radishes, follow them up with summer plants. We'll talk about that with another picture in a minute. Uh, interplanting means you can plant short-term plants like radishes in between longer-term plants. Some people put a radish between each onion. And as they both grow, the radishes are done in two to three weeks, while the onions are gonna take a couple months. So when the radish is gone, it leaves space. Ideally, you want to draw up some kind of plan. How much detail you put into it is up to you. You don't need graph paper. You don't need a lot of detail, but many of the best gardeners do. Here's another type of plan. This is called square foot gardening, where each 12 by 12 plot or whatever dimension you choose is only one type of plant growing in it. And you can just scatter the seeds in that area and then thin it out later, okay? There's a planting schedule that some people, especially uh, commercial growers, will all work off a planting schedule like this. And a simple home garden, you don't have to do that much detail, but I wanted you to be aware of it. Here's a succession planting chart, okay? Broccoli, for instance, will carry you into June and maybe July, but then you can plant fall broccoli in August and September, which will produce in the fall, okay? Um, you can have multiple plantings of beets. You can follow up lettuce with fall lettuce, or you could plant a cucumber or bean in the interim there. So succession planting works. 
And you can find charts like this online readily. A harvest schedule. Again, commercial growers live by this kind of thing. But the seed packet will tell you how many days to maturity and planting. Winter squash are going to take three months, June, July, and August. As long as you have an idea of when to expect the thing to be ripe, you'll know whether to, you're picking it too soon or too late, which is worse. So when you're ready, prepare the garden. Clean up the bed. If you have an old garden, pick up all your trash left from winter. Ideally, you should have cleaned up your garden in the fall because with a vegetable garden, you don't want debris laying all over it. But if there is, clean it up as early in the winter, I mean, as early in the spring as you can get in the garden and work, work to clean it up. Rake it off, burn it off if you're allowed where you are. Sometimes you'll have old stumps and roots of tomatoes, peppers, kale, whatever. Get rid of them. Some people with large gardens plant cover crops in the fall. Uh, we don't have time to go into the detail of cover crops, but they can be planted in the fall, stay covering the ground, as it says, all winter, and then get tilled under in the spring so that something like rye or clover can be uh, putting nutrients back into the soil as you plow them in. You must have workable soil in the spring to dig. Okay, do not go out there when the soil is soggy wet to try to plant your garden. It's got to be uh, dry enough that you can dig up a bunch and run it between your fingers so that it doesn't clot up in your hand like a mud ball. Double digging is another, another technique that some people use where you dig soil from one area, dump it in another and back and forth around and around. Makes a little extra work in my opinion, but some people do it. I already talked twice, I think, about how important it is to improve your soil with soil amendments. Organic material, home compost you can make on your own. Uh, you can buy a compost bin. You can build one out of, out of fencing. There's lots of options. Again, composting is a, a good hour long program in its own. And you can find a lot of information on home composting online if you're interested in doing that. Manure <clears throat> is a common form of organic matter, but you cannot use fresh manure from a stable whether it's horse manure or cattle manure or whatever it might be, it needs to be seasoned so that it's not harsh and fresh to go into your garden. A year old pile of manure is great to plow into your garden. But more commonly, people have leaves, can access straw. Lawn clippings are good as long as they're not full of uh, herbicides, okay. Fertilizing the garden is another part of it. You don't have to pour fertilizer into the garden initially, especially if you have put in compost and other organic material, you don't need to fertilize up front for the whole garden. But basic concepts of fertilizer are that they must include, it must include nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That's NPK. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is a K from the Latin that uh, is the symbol for potassium on uh, the uh, chemical chart. Most balanced fertilizer that you can buy in a store, whether it's miracle Grow or any other variety, is 10, 10, 10, the same amount of all of those. Many plants, however, will need more nitrogen. So you can buy various 
distributions of the three ingredients on different products. You can buy 25, 5, 10, for instance, which gives you a much heavier content of nitrogen, which is what you need for green leafy crops primarily. If you're going to fertilize your garden in its entirety, fall is the best time to do that. But spring is okay too. Again, I have a, after working my garden for decades, really, I don't do that anymore. I might fertilize individual plants along the way, but not the entire garden itself. When you do that, you're also fertilizing any weeds or anything else that's gonna come up. Okay, if you do want to, especially initially, if you're starting a new garden, you want to till it in to the top four to six inches so that the roots get at it or just fertilize the individual plants, like I said. So next, <clears throat> when do you plant in the spring? You might know already that the entire country is divided into plant hardiness gardening zones. We are in zone 5B right here. These are based on temperature charts. The Northwest corner of Illinois was split off into its own zone called 5A a few years ago. Lower part of Illinois is much warmer climate. And ironically, the lakefront is equal to South Central Illinois because of the warming effect of Lake Michigan but know that you are living around here in 5B. This is the S for sandwich right here, okay? There are other diagrams available online too that will uh, show you spring and fall frosting dates, average frosting dates. This says the average date when the temperature last drops below 32 degrees in the spring for us is somewhere in mid-April, okay, toward the end of April. We rarely get freezes. This again, this is us right here. We rarely get freezes below 32 degrees after the end of April, April 28th. And in the fall, the same kind of thing. When is the first date when temperature drops below 32 degrees? And it's usually mid-October. Now you can get some frost before then because it doesn't have to be freezing to frost. You can have 35 degrees in frost often, okay? So you can find these kinds of maps and the uh, seed packets will often tell you what to plant when too. Vegetables can be divided into various categories. Some are spring loving plants like these. If you're planting from seed, plant kale, onions, etc., peas, potatoes. The old uh, farmer's almanac says plant your potatoes on Good Friday, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because Good Friday can be a long way from one day to another in spring year by year. But these are plants that like the spring and will grow in the early spring. So generally April, I'm planting this kind of stuff. Asparagus, transplanted plants, these are spring plants that if you're not planting seed, you can buy the plants wherever and put them in the ground in April too, okay? Then you have some frost tolerant plants that maybe aren't as hardy as those on the last list that I just showed you, but they're still spring plants. Beets, carrots, radishes, Swiss chard, cauliflower, Chinese cabbage, all of those are spring plants, can be planted anytime in late April and early May. And of course, these dates that we're showing here are evolving dates. As global warming moves warmer temperatures, climate change pushes up from the south, our springs are coming earlier and our falls are 
lasting longer, coming later and lasting longer. So these are tender summer crops, okay? Should not be planted before mid to late May. Garden beans, summer squash, tomatoes, usually you're safe by May 20th to plant any of these. It would be very rare day in May when we would get cold on May 25th, but it happens. And then you have heat loving plants who should never be planted before the end of May, or even many people say wait till June 1st, okay? These are plants that originated in Mexico and Central America historically and have been modified to be able to grow up north here, but they will not grow, they will die in the early spring. They must have a warm climate, okay? How you plant is up to you. There are various methods. Many people plant straight rows. Some people broadcast seed. That means, you know, spreading them out, tossing it out like in the uh, square foot garden design that I showed you. Or you can take just a whole section. Some people broadcast um, native pollinator flowering beds that way. Some people also plant in a hill or drill your seeds for squash or cucumbers, push them down in a circle around each other, but try to be aware of proper spacing and depth, okay? The smaller the seed, the less depth you need. A larger seed like a bean or a pumpkin seed is gonna go down an inch or so, but tiny seeds like lettuce and others just below the surface of the soil, an eighth of an inch. Okay? If you plant them too deep, the tiny seeds, they won't sprout. Cover all your seeds lightly. Don't just leave them on the top of the soil, but cover them with a little bit of soil, at least in the case of lettuce and others, and then kind of pat it down so that it doesn't blow away loose on top. As the plants grow, you sometimes need to thin them out. If they're too close together in a row or in another section. This picture is someone who grew his own seed here or her own seed. And in this case, sometimes if these plants grow larger, um, some people will just cut off the weaker of the two and throw it away and use the whole soil section here to plant the remaining. Other people will split the section down the middle and go for two plants out of one planting section. Try your options. Setting transplants. You never want to take new transplants out on a hot, sunny day in June, okay? Always plant later in the day when the sun is not beating down on them or ideally on a cloudy day where they can have at least 24 hours before the sun hits them hard again. Water them in their little pots before transplanting them so that this root base here of this tomato plant is soaked. And then once you put them in, uh, water around them again. They handle plant with care, of course, they are breakable. And if you break them off, many of them will be done for. Plant the plant in almost all cases at the same depth at which it was growing in the little pot that you bought it in, okay? Tomatoes are the only option for that. A tomato plant can be kind of laid down sideways like this because it will root all the way up its stalk. Some people will take it and plant it like that, where it's laying sideways and then curves up. And it gives you a lot more root growth underneath. And root growth is number one important factor in getting seedlings starting well, OK? 
Okay. Sometimes protection is needed in the spring. If you think cold is coming, there are various ways to protect your plants. This is just one option with your, your bottom is cut out of this milk jug and it's dropped over the plant on a stake so it won't blow away. And that keeps any frost or real cold air from it. Floating row covers are another option. They are clear plastic where you can just lay them over the plants on cold nights, or you can have a framework, like an arched framework, front, middle, and back, that raises it up over the plants a few inches. Some people leave that kind of thing on quite a while. Some people use this kind of thing to protect from insects later, okay? Some other options, necessary factors in caring for the garden. Weed control, cultivation, mulching, watering, adding fertilizer if necessary, and protecting them. We're gonna talk about each of those. So first of all, some people don't really care to put much work into weed control like this guy. I hope you can read that. I do admire your honesty in garden planning. Onions, weeds, beans, weeds, peas, weeds, beets, weeds. <laughs> he uh, knows that weeds are inevitable. And he just said, what the heck, I'll share my garden with the weeds. But most people don't want to do that. You want to get rid of the weeds because they do compete with your vegetables for moisture and nutrition from the soil. In a small garden, you can always hand pull them, especially in the early spring when they're little. That's the easiest time to do that. Cultivating means hoeing, basically. Okay, You can mulch around your vegetables. Some vegetables do very well with mulch around them, like peppers and tomato plants, for instance, eggplants, um, where you can lay a mulch of wood or leaves or uh, straw or plastic or whatever you want. And that will definitely keep the weeds down. Some people plant things closer together than maybe is recommended on the, on the seed chart or on online, especially plants like squash, for instance, that have very big leaves. The large leaves will grow together side to side and shade the garden underneath and reduce the number of weeds. I've done that many times and it does work. Your last choice, of course, chemicals are always your last choice. You can use a herbicide in the garden, but if you're going to spray something like Roundup in your garden, be careful and assume that you're probably going to lose some vegetables in the process too, because of wind drift or careless spraying. Okay, more on weed control. Start early, in other words. If you wait too long, your job is much harder. The weeds will take over, okay? Cultivation, to keep the weeds from taking over. Besides that, it breaks up the crust on the hard, dry summer soil provides aeration, and the roots of plants need oxygen just like we do, okay? Shallow cultivation won't disturb the roots too much if you stay away from the, from the plant itself. This is a typical hoe in use. These are other types of hoes uh, called a scuttle hoe. Uh, I lost the name of the other one. I think there's one called a Norway hoe. Some of them are made to go backwards and forwards, okay? Like this one with the triangle, you push it forward rather than the typical hole which you pull backwards. And this guy, of course, has a wheeled cultivator, which if you have a lot of space and long rows, you can walk behind it and push it along and clear the, clear the weeds and break up the soil too. You can use mulch to keep the weeds down. Organic mulches 
as I mentioned, straw, grass, leaves. Synthetic mulches just means it's made of something else, plastic usually. I've seen people use old tablecloths, bed sheets. If you don't care too much about the appearance of your garden, you can use almost anything like that. Okay, the proper application, you don't need more than a, a couple inches. You do not need to pile six inches of mulch around everything, okay? Watering is important, obviously, but only if you're not getting rain. Most plants like an inch of water per week, okay? If you're getting that much rain or more, don't add more. You can cause more problems. If you're not getting at least an inch of water per week, and that's why I had a rain gauge on your list of supplies up, up in the beginning of this presentation, then you wanna water, but ideally at the base of the plant. Soaker hoses work well to provide drip irrigation where you don't have to do the work. Lawn sprinklers are not recommended. I'd never use a lawn sprinkler on my garden. As a beginning gardener, I did when I didn't know any better. But again, it waters the entire space, which also waters weed seeds and sprouts them. Okay. And it, when you spray the leaves of the plant, especially in cool, damp weather, it facilitates fungal growth. So most people will recommend that you water your garden in the morning so that if plants do get wet, they have time to dry off. If you water your plants at night, in the summer evening, cool dampness can set in and you can facilitate fungal growth or bacterial growth, okay? Be gentle if you're talking about new seeds and new seedlings. Blasting them with the hose is gonna mess up your entire row or knock the seeds, seedlings right out of the ground. So water gently with a, a spray pattern. And ideally, if you have tomatoes, pepper plants, anything like that, just water around the base of the plant, okay? Some people will actually create like a moat around each tomato so that that area will hold water, whether you're doing it or raining. Here's some more pictures of soaker hoses. Uh, this kind of setup is like for a commercial plot usually. I don't see that in home gardens. It's a, an expensive setup, but you can buy, if you have access to a hose faucet of some kind, nearby, you can run it this way with, with some soaker hoses. You can do it off rain barrels too, if you have rain barrels, but just know that rain barrels don't give you the water pressure that your outdoor faucet gives you, okay? You can raise your rain barrel up higher to get more pressure, but it's still, if you want pressure, you need city water pressure. Caring for the garden then with fertilizer is next. Fertilizer can be synthetic, like you buy at the store, can be natural, like manure that I talked about earlier, can be expensive sometimes, or it can be free. If you can get treated seasoned manure from stables somewhere. <laughs> this couple has a little disagreement about their manure, okay? <laughs> Please tell me you didn't pay for that stuff. I hope she didn't. Again, fertilizer is a blend of nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. These, this design here should have put the phosphorus up ahead because it's always called NPK and potash or potassium is K in the NPK listing, okay? 10, 10, 10 is a good uh, broad spectrum fertilizer. But as I mentioned earlier, some veggies like lettuce and, and total greenery can use higher end fertilizer, 
more nitrogen. Once your plant is producing fruit like tomatoes or peppers, you don't really want to give it a lot of fertilizer because you're going to promote more leafy growth when you really want fruit. Okay. <clears throat> then the last part is, excuse me, protecting your produce. And even if you don't live next to the, to the forest, as I mentioned earlier, you still need to protect your produce. I know I do. I forget this lady's name, but she's uh, a famous uh, cartoon character. Uh, I can't remember her name right now. Maxine, oh, there it is right there. This is Maxine. Anyhow, Maxine provides the rabbit's buffet. And I do too. <laughs> Every gardener, even in town does. So if you think you need to put a fence around your garden, don't do this, okay? This looks nice, but it will do nothing to keep the critters out of your garden. This is the only kind of fence basically that works. It's like a chicken wire or they have rabbit mesh, which is tighter on the bottom. Some people say you need to bury this fence a few inches in the ground. I've not found that to be true. I did that once, but never again. The rabbits have never once dug under my chicken wire, nor have they ever jumped over it. If you have deer, you have a bigger problem, obviously. But even two foot high chicken wire fence is enough to keep the rabbits out, okay? What problem you do have is sometimes the bottom level will just get bent or raise up somehow, or the ground will sink under it, and it can leave enough for the baby rabbits to get under, okay? It is amazing how small a hole they get through. Then as you're growing, be a good citizen, okay? Protect the planet. Compost. Don't throw all your plant waste in the garbage can to fill up the, the landfill. We're gonna need landfills for our children's children. And the more we fill them up now, the less chance they're gonna have for them. Someday they're gonna be able to really make it common that our garbage produces fuel energy for us. And that's being done in small scale now, but grow organically wherever possible, avoid chemicals, always read directions when you do use any pesticides and fertilizers, conserve water. We don't have a major water issue around us right now, but if you've read the news, even the city of Joliet is worried that their uh, city wells are gonna dry up in the next 20 years. So they're making plans to build a pipeline from Lake Michigan to the Joliet area to provide water. It will happen someday. And as you grow a lot of food, be a good neighbor. Share it with family, friends, or anyone who might be hungry. Local food pantries will love it. And around here, you know, we have uh, four food pantries that I'm aware of. St. John's Lutheran Church in Samanac, Cornerstone Baptist in Sandwich, Harvest Chapel in Sandwich, and the Kendall County Food Pantry in Yorkville, which the Plano Community Garden grows for. Some resource information for you as you look up uh, answers to your questions. University of Illinois Extension offers a great site in its horticulture section. So there is the uh, link. All those topics are available. And if you're really interested in gardening and would like to become a master gardener, all of the surrounding counties offer programs. And I gave you the names of the three uh, program coordinators from uh, Kane and Kendall are lumped together. DeKalb is lumped with uh, Ogle and Lee counties, I think, maybe Winnebago, I forget, but the headquarters is in DeKalb. And LaSalle County, if you live down that way, their headquarters is in Ottawa and they're connected with Bureau. All the Illinois counties are grouped now for saving money in the state budget. Okay. 
You can also find an extension um, application for Master Gardener online if you want to fill one out online if you're really interested. Final thoughts. Patience is a virtue, someone said long ago, and Ralph Waldo Emerson said, adapt to the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. Somebody else created this idea, gardens grow by trowel and error. They grow by trial and error too, but they all grow by trowel and error because as Rudyard Kipling said, gardens are not made by sitting in the shade. Work is involved, but that work has its rewards. Not only do you get to eat things, but you might get to enter them in the Sandwich Fair or the Kendall County Fair when you're done and win some prizes and some ribbons. Okay, coming to an end. As you love gardening, don't be upset with those people who don't. They might be very busy people, or maybe not. <laughs> maybe they just don't want to garden. Maybe they're like this guy, I prefer my kale with a silent K right here. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of our program. So Matt, if you have any uh, questions, I'll be glad so to. Much, Steve, uh, what great information, uh, great uh, tips, learning uh, new stuff that I had never heard before. So thank you uh, for sharing your time with us. We do have some questions and so um, I will uh, start those right now. The first question we have is, uh, just came in, how do you test your soil to see if it is too acidic? Um, the best thing to do is take soil samples and send them to, or take them to a soil testing lab. That will not only tell you your pH balance, but it will also tell you whether you're overloaded or undervalued in nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, um, many other nutrients that are in the soil that we don't think about. There are some uh, local, the, the uh, extension offices don't have labs themselves. That requires a chemistry lab to do that. So uh, you can work through, usually it's the farmers that are most interested in testing their soil. So the um, ag centers will do that. Uh, I know over in Yorkville, there were a couple um, on Route 47, just south of the Kendall County Extension Office. There are two, um, trying to remember the names of them, two places anyway on Route 47 there. You can probably Google uh, soil testing. If you're just interested in getting your pH, there are pH testing kits you can buy at a at a hardware store or a big box a Home Depot or Menards usually. I can't speak for their reliability, uh, but they're available if you want to try it. Excellent. Thank you. Great question and good information. Um, here's a, another question we have. How different is fruit and growing, and do you know anything about growing grapes? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I have grapevines. Uh, actually, I only have one left anymore. I had three, but over the decades, two died out and I didn't replace them. So I grow seedless Concord grapes for making grape juice or jam or jelly. Uh, it's not hard to grow grapes. The important thing about growing them is uh, pruning them properly. Which, good segue, Matt. <coughs> the uh, Sandwich Park District every year runs a spring gardening workshop. I say every year because we've done it for 13 years. I help coordinate that. And uh, last year we couldn't, of course, because of the pandemic. But this year we have our workshop on April 10th, Saturday morning. We're allowing half capacity audience in the conference room. And we're opening up on Zoom to anyone who wants to get in at home. Um, and one of the topics there is growing and pruning grapes. Oh, excellent. So if that person who asked that question is interested, uh, call the Park District and register for the presentation on 
April 10th, uh, Richard Henschel, the horticulture educator from the University of Illinois will be the speaker presenting that. Nancy Christian from Redbud will also be a speaker that morning as will, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as will Josh the Arborist from the Davy Tree Company talking about the benefits of trees and how to care for trees in your home landscape, so. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've, uh, here's another question. Um, one has written in, I've had issues with unwanted mushrooms growing in my raised garden beds. What's the best way to get rid of them? Uh, well, mushrooms only grow on uh, degenerating plant material underneath. So I would suggest you take them out and then uh, till up the soil in the raised bed. Dig it up with a spading fork or shovel or something, loosen it up and let it dry out a little more to help uh, stop the overabundance of mushrooms. Great. Um, oh, the question about the square foot gardening. Have you done that? And are there any tips that you have for trying that out for first time? Okay, I, I have not personally done it. Um, one of our speakers at a park district event, maybe eight years ago or so, did a whole presentation on it and highly recommends it. Um, I just, I haven't tried it. I have raised beds and I have a flat open garden. Um, so I can't provide personal tips on success with that, but I know that presenter that day uh, spoke very positively of it after doing it at, in his home garden for years. Uh, I would suggest that you Google square foot gardening online and uh, with his recommendation, and he was a minister from Samana, so you have to trust him, right, Matt? Right. <laughs> Um, someone uh, mentioned that they had some old fertilizer in their shed and they're wondering if, if that's still good or if it loses uh, potency over time. Well, it depends on how much time, I guess. It, it's good for a few years. I've used old fertilizer like that. Um, I don't know how much or how fast it loses its effectiveness, but um, you know, if it's 10 years old, I probably wouldn't use it but a few years won't matter. Uh, any thoughts on how to get rid of grubs in the garden? Oh yeah, grubs are, are an issue, especially if they are Japanese beetle grubs. Everyone's been familiar with Japanese beetles in recent years, if you grow anything in your yard, I think. Um, there are products that will kill grubs but they will also kill beneficial insects in the soil and they will kill other grubs that uh, like June beetles, which are harmless insects. Grubs will eat the roots of plants, but by the time the grubs, by the time your plants are growing, the grubs have also grown and are gone generally. And most of your grubs are gonna be found in your lawn, not in your open vegetable garden that had nothing growing in it with no roots over the winter. Japanese beetles, for instance, they will not usually lay their eggs in a vegetable garden plot. They will lay their eggs in the lawn space. Great. Um, you had mentioned, let's see, you had mentioned the fall broccoli and fall lettuce. Um, yes. Just a clarification, are those different varieties or is that just no. what you call it, is it the same seed just planted later on? Correct, same species just planted later on. Um, ideally, if you want to grow fall broccoli or cauliflower, your best bet would be to start the seeds um, in late August or early September in order to have enough time to actually get some uh, produce harvested from those. Some people will start them inside, just in little flats in the house somewhere or on the porch under, uh, under light, 
until they're big enough to put out in the garden. And you can do that in July. You can start your seed then and have it ha have six inch plants ready to put out in September. That would be ideal. But they are the same varieties, yes. Excellent. Um, question about squash beetles. Every year they're getting squash beetles and you're wondering if the soil is still good because those beetles are taking over the entire raised bed. Yeah, squash beetles, you know, they, that's why they call them squash beetles. Partly because they eat squash, but also because that's your answer, squash them. <laughs> um, but the question is about the soil. You cannot get away from squash beetles if you grow squash. They are all over the Midwest and they're prevalent everywhere. They do lay eggs in the soil and those babies will hatch out in the spring. So um, if you do have a horrible problem with squash beetles in a raised bed, you might wanna consider getting rid of the top several inches of soil and replenishing it with new fresh soil for this year. Good. Good. Um, another question here, do you have a preference on a kind of compost container or even a brand? Um, you know, I don't even know the brand that I have. You've got all of the uh, garden centers and garden catalogs um, will sell various types. I have the type that spin so that you can mix the stuff inside it, which you have to do. Um, there are straight like trash can types which have openings in the bottom so that you just pour your stuff in there and then you're supposed to be able to pull a compost out of the bottom. That doesn't work well unless you get in there and stir it up. If anybody's had a compost pile, just an outdoor pile, which um, people use, um, what do you call the, uh, the flats on which products are stored in stores? Yeah. Um, uh, whatever that word is that I'm losing, you can build them out of that or any kind of wood, as long as you have air circulation going through it and leave one side open, you can walk right into it and stir it up with a, a pitchfork. It, you have to aerate it and you have to keep it moist. So when you have a spinning bin, uh, that works well for me. In fact, it often gets too moist inside because I, we put out tons of kitchen waste and I don't have enough dry material. Dry leaves or dried grass clippings are the only things naturally dry material, but you only have dry leaves in the fall generally. So sometimes I shred newspaper and put it in my compost bin to help soak up the moisture and that works well too. Excellent. Great. Well, I think those are all the questions. So once again, Steve, thank you for your time and your expertise and for sharing this. Uh, this is being recorded and will be posted on our uh, program archive on our website. And so you'll be able to access okay. again if you want to see some more um, uh, of the information if you didn't get it all written down. I do want to make you aware um, that we will be having a... Um, a program coming up at the end of the month uh, with an author who has written a book. Uh, this is going to be an author session with Loren Pernod. Uh, he's written a book called There and Here, Small, Town, Small Illinois Towns with Big Names. And one of those towns he has written about is uh, Sandwich. And so uh, he's got a nice uh, book that um, covers a bunch of different communities in Illinois. And we're one of them. And so that'll be a Q&A with that author on Tuesday, March 30th at 6.30 p.m. And you can uh, find that information again on our website. And um, we we'll look forward to seeing you there as well. So thanks so much for tuning in today. Again, thank you, Steve, for uh, being with us. You're welcome. Happy to do it. Great, great. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye. Okay, bye now.